As the year comes to a close, many of us reflect on the fond memories we've had and the accomplishments we've achieved this year. But we also remember the bad times, or in some cases, the tragic moments that changed lives forever. While acts of terrorism are no doubt some of the scariest events that have occurred, we wanted to discuss lesser known cases as we so often do on my channel. Thank you for all of your support in 2016, and I look forward to the next year with you. Now, let's begin the episode. In August, Lenata Lester finally decided to leave her abusive boyfriend, 27-year-old Derek Dearman. She went to stay with her five relatives in Alabama, but Derek had a nasty temper when things didn't go his way, and he wasn't about to let her go that easily. In the early morning hours of August 20th, Derek injected himself with methamphetamine before breaking into Lenata's relative's home with evil intentions and an axe in hand. Lenata woke to the sound of gunshots as 23-year-old Justin Reed attempted to fend Derek off, but to no avail. Derek then took both the gun and the axe to Justin's pregnant wife, 22-year-old Chelsea Reed, along with the other adults in the house, Joseph Adam Turner, his wife Shannon Randall, and Robert Lee Brown. Standing in the midst of a nightmare, Lenata realized Joseph and Shannon's three-month-old infant had been spared, and she attempted to escape with the baby, but was forced into a vehicle by Derek. The murderer drove his ex and the child to his home in Leakesville, Mississippi, where Lenata managed to escape with the infant. Just as Lenata alerted authorities of the massacre of her family, Derek turned himself in and confessed to the crime. Police called the scene horrific and gruesome, as all five victims had multiple axe wounds, including Chelsea Reed, who was five months pregnant. Derek Dearman blames his actions on the methamphetamine he took that night and has pled not guilty in the preliminary hearing. The trial is still ongoing, but he faces six counts of murder due to Chelsea's unborn child. Thanksgiving for the Guy family was a happy occasion. 28-year-old Joel Guy Jr. drove up from his home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana to Knoxville, Tennessee to spend the holiday with his parents and twin sisters. Thanksgiving Day came and went without incident, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Then, the following Monday, 55-year-old Lisa Guy never showed up for work and missed a crucial meeting. Co-workers requested officers do a welfare check, and police walked into a crime scene straight out of a nightmare. Lisa and her husband, 61-year-old Joel Guy Sr., were found scattered in pieces inside the house, their bodies dismembered. There were allegedly signs of torture in addition to the multiple fatal stab wounds on their bodies. It also appeared as though someone tried to destroy the evidence in an acidic mixture of chemicals in a bathtub. Investigators zeroed in on the son, Joel Jr., an unemployed LSU dropout. Joel had planned to ask his parents for money over the holiday, but allegedly they informed their son they were cutting him off financially, in hopes he would start fending for himself. Joel Jr. was arrested and faces two counts of first-degree murder. Joel's sisters are understandably shocked and devastated by the disintegration of their family, saying they'd plan to have Christmas together soon. Lisa and Joel Sr. had also recently sold their home and were moving in order to start the next chapter of their life in retirement. In August, the Schwab family from Olathe, Kansas wanted to spend one of their last free days of summer at Schlitterbahn Water Park in Kansas City. The park made recent news in 2014 when it opened its most ambitious ride yet, the world's tallest water slide, which they called Verrucht, German for insane. The ride sat three passengers into a raft, securing them with Velcro straps, and plunged them down a 17-story drop, then up a smaller crest before a five-story drop into a pool at the bottom. Footage of early test rides showed sandbags flying off the rafts, failing to stay harnessed inside, which possibly delayed its opening. 
Still, Verruckt received a safety pass from the state audit and was open to the public without incident. However, on August 7th, 10-year-old Caleb Schwab and his older brother Nate had no idea their day of fun would end in horrific tragedy. The brothers climbed to the top of Verruckt, but were unable to ride down together as they didn't meet the required minimum weight. So both boys went down with strangers, beginning with Nate who waited at the bottom for Caleb to make his descent. But as Caleb's raft ascended after the initial drop, his harness came loose, sending him flying. His neck collided with one of the metal loops at 65 miles per hour, decapitating the young boy and killing him instantly and leaving his brother, who witnessed the horrific accident, hysterical. An investigation into the ride revealed there were several complaints of other riders' shoulder straps dislodging and the park was not actively maintaining tests of the ride, which was closed permanently following Caleb's death. Caleb would have started fifth grade the following week. In Anderson, South Carolina, 30-year-old Kala Brown and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Charlie Carver, had only been dating for a few months when they decided to move in together. Things between the couple were progressing smoothly, that is until late August, when they both went missing. Kala's parents knew something was wrong when they found her apartment door unlocked and her beloved Pomeranian dog alone inside. Their daughter's car was still in the parking lot, but there was no physical or digital trace of her. Both Charlie and Kala had seemingly vanished, but beginning on September 6th, Charlie's friends noticed something suspicious on his Facebook profile. Charlie, who rarely ever used social media, was posting, commenting, and updating pictures, but his posts didn't sound like him and were riddled with grammatical errors. He claimed that he and Kala were fine and that they just decided to leave, but with time it became apparent things were not fine. Charlie was liking the pages family members set up concerning the missing couple, and one of the most ominous images posted was one that read, Sometimes late at night, I dig a hole in the backyard to keep the nosy neighbors guessing. Beyond the worrisome social media activity, police had few leads for months. Then, in early November, authorities were combing the property of a 45-year-old real estate agent and registered sex offender named Todd Kolhep. There they found Kala Brown alive, chained like a dog, inside of a shipping container. Kala, who'd worked for Todd, helping him clean up properties before showings, was kidnapped and held hostage by her boss for over two months. Kala revealed to police that there were possibly up to four other bodies buried on the property, and after excavation, police found three. The remains of Charlie Carver and two other victims, Megan and Johnny Coxie, whom Todd had killed in 2015. Charlie was gunned down and allegedly, Kala was forced to watch. While in custody, Todd also admitted responsibility for the unsolved superbike murders in 2003 in which four people were killed. So far, he's been charged with kidnapping and seven counts of murder. And while Kala survived the ordeal, she's filed a civil suit against him for the injuries and severe emotional distress her captor caused her. As of December 23rd, Anchorage, Alaska has seen a record-breaking 30 homicides in 2016, its deadliest year on record. But summer was the season that brought residents the most anxiety. After a string of murders occurred, the public wondered if there was a serial killer in their midst. On July 3rd, a passerby on the Ship Creek Trail bike path came across the bodies of 20-year-old Brianna Foisy and 41-year-old Jason Netter Sr., both of whom had struggled with drugs. Then, almost two months later, another pair of bodies showed up in the valley of the Moon Park. The victims were 25-year-old Bryant DeHewson, a local environmental activist, and 34-year-old Kevin Turner, who, according to family, lived with a mental illness. The final known victim, 21-year-old Travion Thompson, was killed on July 29th. All five of the victims had been murdered with the same gun. The public, growing distressed, demanded answers from authorities who were reluctant to reveal details of the investigation to avoid tipping off any potential suspects. Police caught a break in the case in November, and it almost cost another life. 
When Anchorage police officer Arne Saleo approached 40-year-old James Dale Ritchie about a cab fare he'd failed to pay, James suddenly pulled out a gun and fired at the officer. Arne was shot four times but survived his injuries following two surgeries. During the exchange of gunfire, James Ritchie was also killed and police realized his gun was the same one responsible for the five summer murders. To those who'd known James in high school, they said he'd seemed the unlikeliest of serial killers. He was happy and had enough athletic talent to be considered for the NFL. Officer Saleo and James even attended East Anchorage High School at the same time, though it is unknown if they crossed paths. Allegedly, James's life took a turn for the worst and his promising athletic career tanked as a result of criminal arrests and drugs. As of right now, James hasn't been conclusively tied to all five killings, and we may never know the whole truth behind the murder spree. In November, when 16-year-old Lee Valoria Paulino went missing in the town of Lawrence, Massachusetts, his family knew something was wrong. Police believed Lee had run away, but friends and family knew Lee wouldn't have left his iPhone and wallet behind. Search parties scoured the surrounding area, but Lee was nowhere to be found. Then, on December 1st, the passerby made a horrific discovery while walking her dog. She spotted Lee's headless body along the banks of the Merrimack River. When police searched the area, they found his head 50 feet away behind the local boys and girls club. Due to the condition of the body, the autopsy took over a day and a half to complete, with the coroner concluding Lee had been murdered. During the investigation, authorities made a connection to a Matthew Borges, a fellow classmate of Lee's. According to students, the duo spent a fair amount of time with one another, though Lee's family only met Matthew once, very briefly. When Matthew was questioned, he confessed he and Lee had gone to a spot near the river and smoked marijuana together. Then, for unknown reasons, Matthew had stabbed Lee to death, cutting his head and arm off in the process. Matthew's motive behind the senseless murder is still unknown, but he will be tried as an adult and has pled not guilty. The family struggled to find consolation in their son's gruesome death, saying they were dissatisfied with the way authorities handled his disappearance. The case and trial are still developing. Family celebrating Thanksgiving in Sevier County, Tennessee didn't quite have the holiday they'd planned. On November 23rd, a sudden wildfire broke out from the Chimney Tops area of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Then the blaze began to spread. The fire left an ashen path of destruction, with high-speed winds fanning the flames further and further, encroaching upon the cities of Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge by the 28th. Families fled their homes and livelihoods, and over 400 firefighters coordinated rescues while trying to keep casualties to a minimum, and also while trying to contain the blaze. Approximately 46 engines, 6 helicopters, and 5 bulldozers were deployed in the efforts to keep the fires at bay. Emergency responders received a little help from Mother Nature when several bouts of rainfall and high humidity levels kept the flames from spreading, allowing firefighters to gain control. At the end of it all, the fires had destroyed 1,700 buildings, both residential and commercial, along with 17,000 acres of land and displaced thousands of people. Perhaps most tragic, though, were those that lost their lives in the fires. A grand total of 14 casualties resulted from the blaze. Some residents had lost everything, their homes, livelihoods, family members and friends. But during the investigation, they were forced to try to retain a sense of normalcy and pick up what was left of their lives. A tip line was established to try and determine the cause of the fire, and it wasn't long until authorities arrested two suspects. Police said the accused fire starters are juveniles and therefore their names cannot be released, but it is possible they will be charged as adults. As of right now, the main charge would be for aggravated arson, though it is possible due to the level of destruction and lives lost, those charges will change as the investigation progresses. 65-year-old Zenobia Richmond lived a quiet life at her home in Erie, Pennsylvania, but on November 30th, she heard something fall against her attic door. 
It had been nearly two years since she'd gone into the attic, so when she opened the door and found a mummified body, she was horror struck. Authorities arrived on scene and it was determined that the body belonged to Dyquane Rogers, Zenobia's grandson who had disappeared nearly two years earlier. Dyquane, who had ambitions of joining the Navy or becoming an emergency medical technician, suddenly vanished in October of 2014. His family suspected he'd met foul play as he'd left his phone, wallet, and glasses behind. Friends and family alike formed search parties to aid police, but there was no trace of him. Dyquane's mother, Carol Rogers, told herself over the years that her son had simply left town in hopes that he would return safe one day. But unfortunately, it seems Dyquane succumbed to an internal struggle. The autopsy concluded he had committed suicide. Though his family never knew him to be depressed, he posted on Facebook shortly before disappearing about having the worst luck. This came as a shock to his family, who'd always known Dyquane as happy-go-lucky. Though not all the family agrees with the suicide ruling, the investigation concluded Di Quain had likely been in the attic the entire time he was missing. While the outcome of Di Quain's disappearance ended in tragedy, the family now has answers, though they may offer little comfort. Ten-year-old Victoria Martins had just started fourth grade in Albuquerque, New Mexico in August. She was heavily involved in gymnastics, swimming, and her local church group. But her mother, Michelle Martins, was occupied with drugs and dangerous people. Michelle recently began dating 31-year-old Fabian Gonzalez, and she allowed Fabian's cousin, 31-year-old Jessica Kelly, to stay with her and her daughter. Both Fabian and Jessica had criminal records, but no one could have predicted just how twisted and deadly they were. On August 24th, the police were called to the Martins residence for domestic battery, but upon arrival, they were horrified to find much more. Smoke was pouring out of the apartment, and inside, authorities found the body of Victoria Martins, wrapped in a flaming blanket in a bathtub. While the girl had no pulse, she had suffered greatly. According to her mother, Victoria was drugged with methamphetamine to calm her down before Fabian raped, then strangled her. Jessica then stabbed the young girl to death before dismembering her arms and left leg and setting the body on fire. Albuquerque Police Chief Gordon Eden Jr. called Victoria's heinous murder the most gruesome act of evil he had ever seen in his career. The investigation is still underway, but recent developments have revealed that Michelle Martins was possibly soliciting men online to have sex with her daughter for months leading up to her death. So far, the suspects are all being charged with kidnapping. Michelle and Jessica face charges of child abuse, and Fabian is looking at an additional child rape charge. Grievers, family, friends, and even strangers attended a memorial birthday party for Victoria, those who showed up dressed in purple to honor the girl's favorite color. Vanessa Marcotte, a 27-year-old Boston University graduate, was making her dreams come true. She'd taken her degree in communications and moved to New York to accept a job with Google as an account manager. On August 7th, she traveled home to Princeton, Massachusetts to visit her mother, but it would be her last visit. Vanessa, a regular runner, set out to jog around 1 p.m. that Sunday, but hours later, she still hadn't returned, and by the afternoon, authorities were out looking for her. It wasn't until after dark that a canine unit located Vanessa only about a half mile from her mother's home, dead. Vanessa's body was found nude, and she'd suffered burns to her feet, hands, and head. Authorities knew they were dealing with foul play and ruled her death a homicide. The community, who hadn't seen a murder in 30 years, was rattled, and authorities warned citizens to be careful and stay vigilant. Unfortunately, there weren't many leads to follow. Police asked the public for help in locating a dark-colored SUV that was seen in the area around the time Vanessa was killed. Based on the crime scene, her killer likely had defensive wounds, but it was unclear if Vanessa knew her killer. However, FBI profiler Mary Ellen O'Toole said it was likely the murderer was a stranger and saw Vanessa as an object and likely felt little remorse for his actions. However, she did believe the killer knew the area well and specifically went out looking for victims. 
Those who knew Vanessa said she was known for her radiant smile and was a kind and intelligent woman with a bright future ahead of her. Her funeral service was held in her hometown of Lemonster, and as of December 2016, police say there are no updates. Anyone with information about Vanessa's death or her killer is encouraged to call authorities at 1-508-453-7582. And hopefully, Vanessa will receive the justice she deserves. That's all for now. Be sure to check out my other episodes by pressing here. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel by pressing here. Because you won't want to miss what's next. And I'll see you next year.